Well, I tell you what, I sometimes I cannot believe that it's been since 2018 we've been doing this stuff. Of course, we did take a couple of years. One year we did a deliverance seminar, and then we missed one year altogether. But 2018, that's been a long time. But Matt and I met in Raleigh during the Flat Earth, the first Flat Earth International Conference in 2017. And uh, Matt, it's just been a blessing in my life. He, he stood with me in all that battle. During that time, I was like, I knew, I'd like, I, knew I liked this guy. And um, that was back when he was through. <laughs> with the metal cards. Anybody ever get? Yeah, we had the metal card. But uh, Matt, I love you, brother. And appreciate your stand for the Lord and the Word of God. And uh, we love having you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, man. Yes, sir. Well, through him, all things were made. Through who, I wonder? Well, according to John 1, Hebrews 1, and Colossians 1, Jesus is the maker of all things, including that right there. And according to Romans 1, we can get to know the Creator through the creation. So if that's the case, if we can get to know the Creator through the creation, should we not study and appreciate what that creation is according to Scripture? And when Scripture and science diverge, should we embrace science and reject the Bible, or should we embrace the Bible and reject science? Because you'll say, well, Matt, the Bible's not a science book, and that's true, and it's actually a good thing, because science books were written by men attempting to describe the things of God, while at the same time removing God from the equation. And the Bible doesn't function on such illogic. The Bible has never issued a second, third, or fourth edition because the Bible is ultimate truth, and ultimate truth cannot change. It doesn't bend, it doesn't flex based on scientific trends or theories of the day, right? So, I guess I want to thank Dean and Nancy for having me back, okay? This is uh, one of the only streaks I still have alive in my life as I get older is that I've spoken at every single Skyfall. And honestly, I have, I have two goals in my life for the remainder of my life. One is I live in a neighborhood with no, they have no shoulders on the road. So the mailboxes like jump out at you as you're driving. And so I, I want to never hit a mailbox before I go to the grave. And I never want to be the subject of a Dean Odal sermon. <laughs> that is my goal. So far, so good. Now, um, I like telling jokes uh, to get started, kind of loosen me up, but I thought this time I would just show you guys a joke real quick. <laughs> right there. Thanks. So I was trying to think what to speak about this time, and I was speaking in Boston a couple weeks ago, and I had an older lady look me in the eyes, point at me from the crowd and say, this is what you're supposed to talk about. Do not waver. And of course, the theme of Skyfall was stay the course. So I thought it was fitting that I should speak on biblical cosmology. And of course, Dean was no help. He's just, talk about what the Lord leads, brother, you know, <laughs> when I asked him what to speak on. So, so yeah, I just waited for the Lord to speak, and, and here we are at Biblical Cosmology. So, I obviously have a book on the subject. It's called The House That Jesus Built, and that is about the biblical shape of the earth, an intelligent alternative design. If you guys have read my first version of that book, it's a lot of the same stuff as in here. This is a little bit reorganized in a way for someone who's never heard of the subject, like didn't even know it was a controversy, could take a look at it and, and really get something out of it. I had meant to bring some, but I mean, I only got here with like 25% of my children, so the idea to also bring books along was, was just a little bit too much for me to bear. In fact, I saw Kevin in the lobby this morning in the hotel. He's like, hey, can I get a ride, you know, over to the, the place? And I was like, look, we're meeting down here at 9. Make sure you get here at 8.57 so I don't accidentally leave without you. So 
It's just, you got you to work those systems in. And, but yeah, if you go to mattlongbook.com, that's where you can find that. Uh, a couple other things that we're working on that are really cool. If you guys have heard of Dome Shot, it's the official token of the Flat Earth and the official currency of the FE Clock app from Dave Weiss. Um, we've done some really cool stuff. We airdropped, like, we actually did 33 million uh, on 9-11 to like 1,400 users. And it's actually done about 100x since the launch. So that's pretty exciting. Here's a, here's a chart of it uh, versus NASA's last launch here. So you can see the chart's going up, and, and NASA's obviously coming, coming back down here. Something that's really cool. I don't know if you're into crypto or not, but if you are, it's just something fun to get into. So the funny thing is we actually we use it. So when people refer the app, we pay them in Dome. It's called Dome Shot, Dome for short. And we're actually... At the value that it is now, we're actually paying people every time they refer to the app. We're paying them about eight, the eight eight dollar equivalent U.S. dollars, and the the app costs three bucks. So it's kind of funny. We're, we want to look back ten years from now and realize we were paying people like a thousand bucks a referral for a three dollar app. But it's the it's the first crypto in the history of the world to monetize the spreading of God's true creation. So I think it's pretty cool. So if you go to domeshot.io, you can learn everything you need to learn about it there. Um, I've also gotten into the pickleball space again. Not, not that kind of space, but the pickleball space. This is actually the only pickleball paddle in the history of the world that was designed with a, non, a flat, non-rotating earth in mind. So if you got any pickleball players out there, this is the only one out there, okay? So if you go to cleaver.pro and scroll all the way down to the bottom and click a little, there's a little FE button down there, and there's actually a flat earth version. That's, uh, it's got a flat earth map on it, and that's actually the official paddle of the flat earth. It's amazing what you can claim when no one else wants to claim it. So, <laughs> But I also do, like, real estate development is my official, like, line of business. And if you go to sixture.com with an S, you can see all these things that I do. And if there are any synergies there, like anyone wants to, you know, do some business, I'd much rather do with a Christian flat earther. Uh, of course, so you guys just let me know. So what is biblical cosmology or intelligent alternative design? Well, we've already kind of ripped the Band-Aid off, right? It's this topic of flat earth. That right there, that is an official NASA photo of what flat earthers believe right there, if you guys can believe that. Actually, that's a drawing from Robert Paint Tank Moore right there. It's from, it's from my book. Robert did the illustrations for me. But obviously, yes, nobody, nobody believes this. An actual flat earther or someone who believes in biblical cosmology does not believe this. In fact, we don't believe in a solar system at all, right? We believe in what's called an earth system, something a little bit more like this. So if you were to take the globe and squash it, basically stick your finger on the North Pole, squash it down to where the North Pole is now the center of our creation. Antarctica is no longer a continent at the bottom of the globe, but rather a continental ice shelf that holds the waters in and supports the dome above. So to us, this is all there is. This is the Earth system. And, and, and so the sun, moon, and stars are not distant planets and galaxies far, far away. They're actually smaller, closer, and also located inside our system. I believe that this version is the only version that can fulfill all 200 plus verses in the Bible that speak of the, the Hebrew cosmology, what the Hebrews believed. So what I want to establish first is why this is important so that the Baptists don't uh, come after me, you know, um, for no reason here. But as Christians, I think we need to respect the fact that different things lead different people to Christ. For me, when, and I usually say, like, the only thing worse than Christians when trying to spread flat earth is pastors, right? Um, because they, they actually, they get in the way quite a bit of this movement that I believe is bringing people to Christ. And, and like I mentioned, different things bring different people to Christ. For me, when I was in my 20s, Someone coming up to me and saying, hey, man, Jesus loves you, would not have done anything for me. In fact, I'm sure it happened. And, but to me, like, Jesus wasn't real. Like, I, I had to come at it from a different viewpoint. And embarrassingly, I just needed a little bit more, like, I don't want to say 
proof, but, but I did need to know that there, the Bible was something that you could believe without being an idiot. That's literally what I thought. I was like, oh, you believe the Bible? Oh, well, you like, need a mental crutch. That's what I thought. And after reading the case for Christ and studying many other things, I found out like, oh, like, if you know this stuff, you actually can't be a wise person and not believe the Bible, is, is what I came to. Because my university-level physics, astronomy, and geology classes all told me how this place got here without the help of an all-loving, all-powerful creator. And I also didn't realize that there was a difference between evidence and worldview, okay? Evidence is numbers, readings, measurements. It's, it's unbiased information from which we can speculate and draw conclusions. And a worldview is an interpretation of that evidence. And, and everything you hear from a college professor or see on the Discovery Channel is something that is an interpretation of evidence. A lot of people think they're listening to unbiasedness when they're, when they're watching those shows, but actually they're, they're listening to something that has a very purposeful worldview, and that worldview, it's the scientific worldview, and like I said, it's the worldview that nothing exploded, created everything without the help of an all-loving, all-powerful creator. I want to see if the volume works here. So you're, if, that's how, if that's how you want to invoke your evidence for God, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller as time moves on. So he's obviously not one of the 70 that we talked about earlier, right? But that is the worldview right there. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today. <laughs> Yeah, really funny, huh? So when the two disagree, which mindset are we going to embrace? Which worldview are we going to embrace? Are we going to embrace the worldview that's openly anti-God? Because that's the one that writes all the textbooks. That's the one in universities. That's the one in museums. That's the one on the Discovery Channel. Again, that nothing exploded and created everything without the help of an all-loving, all-powerful creator. I just don't know why we're so anxious to embrace such a worldview. People like Answers in Genesis and Institute for Creation Research, they, they want to be accepted by these people. So I want to go into now about how there is a difference between what we're shown and what we experience. Now, this is not a photo right here. I don't know if you guys can tell. You guys sound like a group that probably know the difference between a photo and an image. And, and I'm going to go into why this is not an evidence-based conversation, and it's because of programming. If it wasn't for programming, you could probably sit down with someone and teach them about biblical cosmology without anger, without, you know, straw man arguments and things like that. If, if you could sit down with someone and say 2 plus 2 equals 4, and they've been taught all their life from when they were little, that 2 plus 2 equals 5, you're not going to be able to rationalize with that person. It doesn't matter how clear the evidence is. So this is what we're shown. And actually, let me go into photos, photos versus images, right? So a photo is a capture of reality. It, and an image is a representation of reality. A photo is when you capture real life and you do nothing to it. An image is when you modify a photo. It's also when you create a, a picture. That's what, that's what an image is. So right here, this, these are the bones that the scientists found. Okay, so this is what we experience, and this is what they drew. All right, this is, a, this is an artist's rendering or an artist's conception of the missing link between men and apes, right? So again, this is what they found, and this is what they drew. This is the artist's conception right there. This right here is 
the Milky Way galaxy, right? This is what we're shown. The only problem is when you scroll down to the bottom in the little tiny print, you can also see that it says an artist's conception of the Milky Way galaxy right there, and it gives, it gives the artist's name, right? What people don't realize is that this is also an image or a drawing or a creation with a worldview behind it. Here's what we're shown. We're shown that the sun travels through the galaxy at 450,000 miles an hour and that the planets revolve around that sun. The earth supposedly goes at, you know, 66,000 miles an hour. The earth is also spinning at 1,000 miles an hour and the universe is supposedly expanding at over a million miles an hour. But what we experience is a flat, non-rotating earth. And this is Mickelson and Morley, the experiment in the late 1800s that proved through the use of optics by bouncing light around right angles in different directions that the earth is not spinning a thousand miles an hour at the equator. It's interesting that Albert Einstein has a quote that says, no amount of experimentation can prove me right. He's a theoretical physicist, all right? No amount of experimentation can prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. It is interesting that after this experiment, he's like, well, he's quoted as saying, I don't, think there, I don't think it's possible to prove the motion of the earth through any optical experiment. He then had to change some of his theories because of it. Yet the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 16.30, Psalm 93.1, Psalm 96.10, and Psalm 104.5, that the earth is fixed and immovable. So two very different things. Remember, science and Scripture, they're not just diverging. They're describing complete opposites. So we're told we live on a spinning ball, right? The two characteristics of a spinning ball are motion and curvature. And we just talked about we cannot prove that the earth is spinning. In fact, we experience that it's fixed and immovable. So... This is the Chicago skyline. Every, a lot of people have heard of this. 50 miles across Lake Michigan. You can clearly see the skyline there of the city. Yet according to curvature math, on a ball 24,900 mi miles in circumference, you shouldn't be able to see a single building across Lake Michigan. So what we're shown is a ball that says we shouldn't be able to see that, yet what we experience is being able to clearly see it. I guess, we can't, I guess we can't trust our senses. That's what they want us to believe. So there's the math there, okay? It comes out to eight inches per mile squared, right? And because of that square, it exponentially increases as you go further and further away. One mile is eight inches, two miles, 32 inches, all the way down to 30 miles is 7,200 inches. And again, according to that math, over 50 miles across Lake Michigan, you should be hiding about 2,000 feet of, of vertical curvature, and there's not a single building in Chicago that's over 2,000 feet tall, yet you can see them all. This right here is a, this is the, a world record photograph. This is some guy standing on a mountain in Spain and taking a picture of a mountain in France. Okay, this is 275 miles away. And according to the formula that we just talked about, there is 10 miles of vertical curvature, or there should be 10 miles of vertical distance hiding from where the guy's taking a picture to what he's taking a picture of. Now, because he's elevated in Spain, you, you have to adjust for that math, and it comes out to about five miles of curvature. Now, the tallest mountains that we know about is Mount Everest. It's roughly five miles tall. This is not Mount Everest. And so even if Mount Everest was on the other side, you should only be able to see the very tip, yet you can see the entire range there. And of course, the Bible talks about the face of the earth insinuating flat. When the devil takes Jesus up onto the high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world, that is insinuating flat because you wouldn't be able to see all the kingdoms of the world on a ball. When Jesus comes back, all the world will see that would, not be able, that would not be possible on a ball. You have Isaiah and Isaiah 40, 22 talking about the circle of the earth, okay? A circle is flat. Isaiah uses a Hebrew word for ball in Isaiah 22, 18, but that's when he's talking about something being tossed like a ball. When he talks about 
the shape of the earth, he uses the word circle very specifically, and a circle is not the same thing as a ball. That's why there's two different words for it. Just like a pizza, a pizza can be round and flat. And Job 26, 7, it says that um, the earth hangs on nothing, okay? That's not, a, that's not a ball floating in space. It's talking about the earth, like the actual ground is not hanging on anything. It's set on pillars and on a foundation, just like it talks about later in Job. And then, of course, the New Jerusalem, which comes down in Revelation, the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, if we were on a ball, would require a hump in the middle the size of 22 Mount Everest, if you do the math, okay? So the Bible also talks about a world with no curvature. But again, here's what we're shown, right? We're shown an earth floating in space with an atmosphere with nothing between that atmosphere and the negative vacuum of space. This is the negative 12 Tor vacuum that would literally suck your eyeballs out of your head if you jumped out of a spaceship, okay? Negative 12 is so insanely powerful, the, the strongest vacuum they can create on Earth is like negative six. And when they do that, like the metal walls are bending in, okay? And, and I was actually at my, my last talk in Boston, there was a guy there who worked on that kind of technology. And he, before he became a flat earther, he was, he was basically a technician um, working with these engineers at NASA and some other groups. They were working on satellite technology. They were working on spacesuit technology. And he kept asking questions like, how do we just use like this little like silicone sealant on the astronauts' suits? Like how does that stand up to the pressure that's creating this vacuum that's bending like metal this thick? Like how does that work? And he couldn't get any answers. And this was before he even knew this was a thing. And he's like, how do they only use like quarter inch thick rivets on, on these items? And, and he wasn't getting good answers. And so, and now he's a flat earther. And so it's, it's quite an interesting perspective. Yeah. But the Bible, again, talks about the opposite. Science says that there's nothing between us and the outside realm. The Bible says that there's a firmament, and in fact, science tells us that we're up against a negative vacuum that is trying to suck things off the planet. The Bible says that there's waters above bearing weight down on us. So again, the exact opposite. It says, it talks about the firmament created on day two. It says that it is a solid, molten looking glass in Job 37, 18. It's called the terrible crystal in Ezekiel 122. It's called the sea of glass that God walks on in Revelation 15 to. It's described as, we, it, the, the Bible describes the waters above the skies. That's David in Psalm 148.4. And that's 1,500 years after the flood. So the canopy theory that the water, that the, the ferment was a canopy and collapsed during the flood and the waters came down and flooded the earth is not possible. And it also says that they're established forever. So that's also a problem for that theory. And Psalm 19.1, if we just want to talk logic for a second, Psalm 19.1 says that the firmament shows God's handiwork, which is interesting because if I was a craftsman and let's say we had an issue with those doors back there and they called Matt and they said, Matt, we need you to replace those doors. And I said, sure, no problem. So I come in, I replace the doors, they function properly, and now I'm up on stage and I want to show you guys like, hey guys, I'm a pretty awesome craftsman. And so I go and I open the doors and I show you like the empty space between because a lot of Bible translations now call it a great expanse and that this great expanse somehow shows God's handiwork, this great expanse of empty space. So if I were to open those doors and be like, look, look at all this, that's not a display of my craftsmanship. A display of my craftsmanship would be to go knock, look how solid these doors are, right, that I built. Like they're not going anywhere. And so the firmament, according to Psalm 19.1, showing God's handiwork has got to be something solid, just from a logical perspective. Something else that's the opposite, right? We're told that the moon reflects the light of the sun, okay? And the light of the sun is warm, right? When you're outside on a hot summer day, or a hot fall day, I guess, we <laughs> when you're outside and it's hot and you go in the shade, it's now cooler, right? But at night... 
when you're out in the moonlight and you're cold, excuse me, if you were hot, excuse me, if you were cold, if you go in the shade, it's now warmer. The moonlight is actually the opposite of sunlight. The moonlight is cold and it's measurably cold. There's been a bunch of people, including myself, that can take a thermometer and take a shot of the grass, for example, that's in the moonlight and the grass that's in the shade. And the light that's in the shade is actually warmer than the light, or yeah, than the light that's in the sun. It's hard to think in opposites here. Um, that's why I can't be a glober because I got to think in opposites. <laughs> and what did Jesus say in Matthew twenty four twenty nine? Jesus said that there'll be a day that will come and the moon will cease to give her light. So there's two clues. One, he says the moon gives its own light, but he also calls it a she. And in that culture, it was just it was thought of that the sun was a he and the moon was a she, insinuating the opposite. And obviously, it's clearly a light bulb. Like, like, my five, like when my daughter was five, I asked her, I showed her a picture of the astronauts walking on the dull gray dust ball, and I showed her a picture of that, and I was like, do you think those are the two are the same things? And she's like, no. And I said, right, so this is obviously like a light. She's like, yeah. And then she goes, so where are those guys standing? <laughs> I was like, well, I don't know. Not sure. Right. We're also told that the sun is a flaming fireball 93 million miles away. We're told that seasons are caused by the tilt of the earth, right? That 23.4 degree tilt that when taken out of 90 degrees is 66.6. Yeah, we're told that because of our tilt, that's what creates the seasons not whether you're closer or further away. I know when I'm next to a campfire, my tilt doesn't really matter. It does matter if I go over here. It definitely cools off, right? I guess I, I would have to, like, if I lean back in my chair, maybe it wouldn't be as hot. But again, we're talking about logic, right? Which doesn't necessarily come into play in some of these conversations. It's why you can't have a logical conversation with somebody about it, because it's programming. So, <clears throat> it's interesting that in the flat earth model, well, in the globe model, it actually says that the sun is further away in our winter than in our summer, and that it's that tilt which is what causes the seasons. And I would say, I don't think that's the case. And in the flat earth model, the sun is actually closer during our summer, and we can talk about that. Here's some more on the actual shadows. This is talking about Eratosthenes. To see if Earth's surface is curved, we needed another well. Turns out we can't see the bottom of both wells at the same time. What might explain this? Well, there are two possible explanations. First, we could have a flat Earth with the sun that's small and close by so that the light hits the second well at an angle. Or second, we could have a curved Earth with a sun that's big and far away so that all the light comes in parallel, but only one well at a time is lit all the way to the bottom. Turns out with just two wells, there's enough wiggle room for both explanations to fit our observations. Eratosthenes only had two wells. So it's interesting that people use that as an example of, Erit they knew the earth was you know, a ball thousands of years ago because of Eratosthenes. That actually, that's actually not the case. You'll find that in so many of these arguments, the people are assuming that flat earthers also believe in a sun that's 93 million miles away, which we don't. So in this case, this is not, shadows do not prove that we live on the ball. In fact, um, if, if you can make the case that it does, you could also make the case that it proves that we live on a flat earth with a smaller local sun. Um, something similar to this, maybe. I don't know if anyone's ever seen anything like this. That is what we experience. Like if you just connect all those rays, where is that pointing? And of course, the Bible talks about in Joshua 10, 12, how the sun and the moon settled over specific locations. This is when Joshua is chasing down the Amalekites and he prays to God to stop the sun and the moon so that the day will last longer so that he can finish off his enemy because he was scared at the sunset, he wouldn't be able to finish them off. So God stops the sun and the moon. He stops the sun over Gibeon and the moon over Agilon and that speaks of a smaller sun and a smaller moon that are closer, that are local, that are located inside our earth system. When I first got into this idea of flat earth, this crazy idea of flat earth, 
I did a couple of my own tests, and this is a test that I did where I thought to myself, if the Earth is 93 million miles away, it should be roughly the same size at noon and at 6 p.m. on a winter day, because we're just talking about a quarter of a turn of the Earth. But if we're on a flat Earth where the sun is traveling above our head, then there should be a significant difference between 12 and 6 p.m. Now, this is on a winter day, so 6 p.m. is pretty close to sunset. It's also very cold, so there's minimal atmospheric magnification. There's still gonna be some, but it's less. And so I took two pictures at noon, and I took two pictures at 6 p.m., and I was kind of shocked when I pulled it up and put the two lines on there and saw that, yeah, there was about a 35% reduction in the size of the sun between noon and 6 p.m. Now, it was probably greater because there probably was some atmospheric magnification because as the sun gets lower in the sky, you're looking through more and more water molecules. But in fact, that, that's exactly what I think we'd experience if we lived on a flat, non-rotating Earth with the sun smaller and located inside our system. But again, like in every single one of these instances, science and the Bible are describing two very different things. And it's only the Bible that sides with our experience in every single one of these things. And it's, it's, it's why you can't have an evidence-based conversation, because if, if we live on a flat, non-rotating Earth, and we experience a flat, non-rotating Earth, and um, experimentation proves a flat, non-rotating Earth, why, why do I have to get up in front of people and explain to them why I believe the Earth is flat and motionless? It'd be a much more interesting conversation for someone to come up here and explain to me why they believe on a they live on a globe, because I'm just saying, well, like, I, I've never seen the curvature, I've never felt the motion. You've never seen the curvature, you've never felt the motion. Yeah, why am I up here talking about why I believe the Earth is flat and motionless? Especially when the Bible describes that as well. So, but I think you guys know why there's an actual conversation, and it's because of these guys. NASA, the Christian organization founded to further God's kingdom, right? <laughs> no, it, they were formed by Nazis, Freemasons, and magicians. And if you're interested in some of that info, look up Operation Paperclip, check out Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard, and then all of the early astronauts, the, you know, the ceremonial lodge that they, they put on the moon, the Freemasonic Lodge. Some crazy similarities uh, between the word NASA, obviously NASA is an acronym, but these people love to use acronyms that mean things. And NASA is very close to a Hebrew word. Nasa, Nasha, however you want to pronounce it. And the interesting thing about that word is that it has a double meaning, okay? It can mean to lift up. So when God gave Cain a mark, Cain said, this is more than I can bear, okay? That word bear, it's to like lift up, all right? It can also mean to beguile, like the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden. The serpent deceived Eve. So it's crazy that this Hebrew word that sounds very close to NASA can mean to lift up like a rocket to space, or it can mean to beguile like the serpent beguiled Eve in the garden. Another interesting correlation is that the Hebrew word for tongue, lashon, means fork of flame, and it sure looks like there's a nice big serpent tongue going right through the NASA logo there. So what we're going to decide is, does it mean to lift up, or does it mean to deceive? And another interesting thing is that during the creation account, God spoke things into existence, right? Every day starts with, and then God said. And it sure looks like, in this case, they're, they're showing a serpent speaking their version of creation into existence with the tongue, of course. So, let's check out what NASA is all about here. NASA employs artists. You guys probably know that if you've seen a Dean Odell sermon here. They, they're called data visualizers, and we're going to learn about what these guys do. Was something NASA latched onto early on. For over 50 years, NASA worked closely with artists and creative leaders like Walt Disney and Norman Rockwell to help shape the stories of spaceflight. It's the same legacy today, just with more advanced scientific understanding and better tools to imagine what far-off worlds might look like if we could visit them. 
we want to take a lot of care to make sure we don't oversell the part of the story that isn't actually the story. There are people who just look and think, oh, NASA's photographed a planet, and they don't understand that actually that was a piece of art. On the other hand, if we don't do that, and we don't put a piece of compelling artwork, then people may never even look at the story anyway. We're putting as much science as we can of where we know today. And I like to think that in 50 years when people come back and look at, say, the various pictures of exoplanets after maybe we actually finally know what they look like, they might wink and smile to each other like, oh, that's so funny, they thought there was water on that one. But also appreciate that this is kind of a historical record of how our understanding of these planets has changed over time. All right, so here, here's a photo, actually, of, of something in space, right? And what's interesting, so remember the, the bones that we found earlier, and then the artist drew what, what they thought, you know, according to their worldview, that that's what would happen? Well, that's what these data visualizers do. They receive information in charts or graphs or fuzzy little photos like this, and they draw, like this is Pluto right here. And I didn't want to ruin it, but this is Pluto, and this is what they drew. This is the first image of Pluto that they created. Now, when we were talking, or when they were playing the video, they said that NASA partnered with artists like Norman Rockwell, and there was another one they mentioned, Walt Disney. So how cool is it that the planet Pluto just happens to have a shape on it that looks like Pluto the dog? Pretty. The crazy there, and of course, Disney is another great group, right? Yeah, awesome. Remember the 66.6 .6 degree tilt of the Earth? Well, of course, Walt Disney has three sixes in his logo, and it also has a firmament on there with a tower whose top would reach into heaven, which is quite interesting as well. Can you guys tell what it says in the reflection there? Wicked, yeah. I wonder why they, they wrote Mickey like that. I'm sure it was a mistake. So we talked about photo versus an image, right? A photo is a capture of reality, and an image is a representation of reality. So this is the blue marble image, okay? And we're going to go into how that's created. I'm going to have to read it on here. This is too small on my screen. So the spectacular blue marble image is the most detailed true color image of the entire Earth to date. Okay, so they haven't used the word photo yet. Okay, Using a collection of satellite-based observations, scientists and visualizers stitched together months of observations of the land surface, oceans, sea ice, and clouds into a seamless true color mosaic of every square kilometer of the Earth, basically. So they admit, this is, and this is, I put the website up here, this is nasa.gov, right? So this is not some crazy website I found it on. You've got, this is Robert Simmon. He's known as like the father of the blue marble. He's the guy that helped create this image in 2002. And it says, he's talking about his job here at NASA. He says, my role is to make imagery from Earth Sciences data. I turn data into pictures, okay? So he's not enhancing photos, he's enhancing data with a worldview behind it, remember. This is what they did, so this is a big description, but at the end of the description of what they did, the, the scientific process of how they got to the blue marble image, he says, then we wrapped the flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface clouds and oceans to match people's expectations of how Earth looks like from space. So where do we get our expectations of how Earth looks like from space? Is it Universal Studios? Like, where, if we don't have photos of what Earth looks like from space, how, how do we match expectations? Well, they've fed us those expectations, and now they're matching them. So here's the first time they use the word photo, okay? Because here's Earth, and it says this is a detailed photo-like view of Earth. Yeah, photo-like. And then we're going to go into some other stuff here. Let's just, wa let's just watch this, all right, with our, with our current abilities in Hollywood, and think if we still think this is real right here. Here's that thing. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99, proceeded, 3, 2, 1... 
Right away, Houston. Thanks, you're good. I, I do feel bad for the guy they left behind who's filming this. It was Bruce Willis. So this is uh, a guy who downloaded this photo from NASA.gov and is now changing the exposures on it so that you can see that there's actually a box around Earth that they cropped into this moon photo here. And again, this is supposedly a photo from NASA. You can see that, yeah, Earth was just cropped in there over and over again, all these things, when you do the exposure. Yeah, you guys know this guy. <laughs> I think he's on the spectrum, but... I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology, and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. Yeah, so someone had asked him why we don't go to the moon, and he's basically saying, well, we destroyed it, along with the telemetry data, right? That's all missing as well. Here's Neil deGrasse talk Tyson talking about the Red Bull space jump and how it, he, it looks like he's jumping from the edge of space, but he's actually not. So if the Earth were actually this, uh, this size, uh, the International Space Station would be orbiting about a half an inch above the surface. And that dude who jumped out of a perfectly good balloon, um, <laughs> what's his name? Felix! Felix Bumgardner. Uh, he would have been about two millimeters above the surface of this globe. That's his edge of space jump. <laughs> now, you know, I, I don't, it's fine. He wants to, I don't have a problem if he does it, but the, the honesty of it would greatly diminish what I think people thought he was actually doing. And not only that, they made sure to photograph him standing there with a really wide-angle lens, which curves horizontal lines. Right. So in the photo, you see this curvature of Earth's surface, and he said, wow, he's in space, look at that. No, he's not. At that height, you don't see, you don't see the curvature of the Earth if you are two millimeters above this beach ball. It is, you just don't. That stuff is flat. So it's interesting, you have people that say, oh, I can see the curvature of the Earth from an airplane, yet Felix Bumgardner is three times higher than an airplane, and Neil deGrasse Tyson is saying, you can't see curvature from that height. So here is, here is the space jump right here. Whoops, oh, sorry. You also have to push down to go forward on this clicker. So if the Earth were actually... So check out the curvature right there from outside the capsule, yet the non-fisheye lens from inside the capsule, look at the horizon there. Pretty flat. All right, we'll skip past this one. Here's a guy who's doing some research in Canada. He's found basically like some Google Street type photos. And this is where NASA trains for their moon missions. And what's interesting is they found some rock formations that look very similar to the rock formations on Mars. They also found a couple hills that look very similar, and they did a comparison here. Yeah, just a little red filter. And then they kept looking, and they found something kind of funny. Oh, wait, oh, look, a rover. It's got a NASA logo on it. And then NASA logo on there, pretty awesome. All right, so this is some technology where it, it's um, oh, contact lenses that augment reality. So it can look like you're you're playing with things in like weightlessness and you can grab it and then they render it in real time, so live. And this is a shot of a guy who thinks he's grabbing something out of the air and putting it away. I think he thinks he's grabbing this guy's hat and putting it away, but, but it's actually not showing up on live TV. And you can see like his eyes look weird, right? And so this is, he's, he thinks he's holding this microphone, but his hand is actually going through the microphone. So his left hand is holding the microphone here, and then he slides his right hand under his left, even though he's supposedly holding the microphone, and the microphone actually is not there. Here's a guy whose head disappears. Whoops. 
This guy totally disappears. <laughs> Gone. This guy reappears. I'm not sure what that's showing there, but obviously some chicanery going on there. Whoops, these guys dissolve. But, and then you can see in the background there, there's a green screen. They love to do their backflips, you know, when they're on live with schools. This guy's cable gets tangled up. Looks this guy in the back grabs it, and then this guy in the front here just grabs it right there just to make sure he doesn't run into anything. Let me just grab that for you. I got it. In case you missed it. See the guy's cables hitting his shirt as he bends down. And then, oh, they had a guy in the background there. Doesn't matter, we'll miss it. All right, so this one, there's a guy actually in the background here. This is a model. Let's see, is it playing? Yeah, there we go. See the guy right in the back behind it? They're pretending that they're launching a satellite here, and this guy realizes he's in the live shot. And then he, go, he goes away. See, look, he's like, oh, wait, oh. And then he's out of there. All right. Whoops. Here's a buddy of mine, Justin Harvey, in front of a city council saying that they need to look into NASA. This is the county which NASA launches from. And this is him describing how some of the Apollo astronauts are still alive. Or excuse me, not Apollo, but um, Challenger. Yeah. I think we all remember the Challenger explosion that took place in 1986 that tragically took the lives of all seven astronauts on board. It launched not too far from where we're standing here today. Well, the interesting thing is, a couple decades later, this thing called the Internet came about, and someone allegedly found almost all of those astronauts alive and well, many using the same exact names. As you can see here, we have Challenger astronaut Judith Resnick and also a Judith Resnick Yale Law professor. Michael J. Smith, the pilot of the Challenger astronaut and also professor at University of Wisconsin, now retired Michael J. Smith. Commander Dick Scobie, who is now president of Cows and Trees. Now, if you'll notice, they all have the exact same faces 30 some odd years later, the same exact name, and they are the same age. And there's been people that have done even further studies into all the members, but he did just those three because they were the most obvious. So if, if NASA is doing all these things that are obviously untrue, isn't it, isn't it likely that they're hiding something? Isn't it likely that they're covering something up? Because if they weren't, I don't, I don't know that we'd see any of this stuff. And so my question is, can truth change? And I would say the answer is no, because truth is truth. Does science change? Science does change. So can science be truth? No, it can't. The two, the two are opposites, in fact, which is why we see the Bible and science teaching the opposite thing over and over again. So has the Bible changed? No, the Bible has not changed. And if you're watching this like months from now, go back and watch Dean Odell's video on the history or part one of the history of the Bible. The Bible has not changed, so can the Bible be truth? I would say yes, it can. So I believe that this setup right here, we're looking at a cross-section on the left, of the Hebrew concept of the world, and we're looking at a sky view, a bird's eye view of the earth down. I believe this is the only, the only model here that can fit all the verses in the Bible. Okay? It's the only one that can fit the 200-plus descriptions of Hebrew cosmology. It's the only one that can fill, fulfill the 70 times that it talks about the sun, moon, and stars as traveling. And it can fulfill it talking about how the earth is fixed and immovable. It can talk about the four corners of the earth, and it can talk about the ends of the earth. The story of Joshua that we mentioned where the sun and the moon stopped in their tracks the dimensions of the New Jerusalem, the firmament and the waters above, the northern lights in Revelation 4-3 where John goes into heaven, he sees the throne, he sees the emerald rainbow around the throne of God. Well, the Bible talks about God residing in the sides of the north, 
okay? So the northern lights, in my opinion, the real ones, the northern lights are the emerald rainbow around the throne of God. Noah's flood, okay? Noah's flood, if you look at this picture on the left, let's picture the firmament like a bowl, an upside-down bowl that you lower into a bathtub, okay, like when you were little. And what happens? You trap the air inside the bowl, right? And if you go like that, the air pops up, right? So God lowers the firmament into the waters, okay? He traps the air in there. And then during the flood, it says that He opens the windows of heaven, all right? Well, if you have a bowl in water and you open a window or you poke a hole in the top, what happens? Water doesn't necessarily come in, okay? But air comes out, so the waters below start to rise. The fountains of the deep burst forth. Why did they burst forth? Because God opened the windows of heaven. He's letting pressure out of the system, so the waters are rising up. It's that air pressure that's holding them down. And, the cra- and so that's in Genesis 7. Well, in Genesis 8, how does he get the waters to subside? Well, I believe he blows air back into the system because the Bible talks about an, a wind that goes over the whole earth at the same time that God closes the windows of heaven and the, and the floodwaters subside. So I think that's a really cool correlation because I think it's exactly how the flood happened. And again, that's not possible on a spinning ball flying through space. So in closing, I, I think with all of this information, okay, we have, we have a responsibility not to cast lies further into the next generation. All right, there's a quote from Max Planck. It says that a scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light. It triumphs by a new generation growing up that's familiar with it, right? And that sounds like kind of a scary, tragic statement, but it could also be encouraging for us, right? Because step one is to... Have more babies, right? So, right, my wife and I joke that you can't convince everyone, so you might as well birth some new ones. So, not only do we feel like we're doing our part by, like, spreading this word across the world, but also having more children that grow up never doubting the biblical model. Bo, the little guy who you see running around here, since he's been two years old, he yells, fake, 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 at the Universal Studios logo when it comes on the deal. And I've never taught him that. I think he just heard some of his siblings saying that. And so he and Winslet, his sister who's right above him, um, they've always done that. And again, it's not something that we taught. It was just a culture that we created. So Jesus is the builder. We, always, we already talked about that. John 1 Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, not only did he make the earth, he made the ages, he made everything. He helped build this family here. I've actually met my wife at a flat earth conference, if you guys didn't know that, and, and the rest was history. We got married four months later. We had a pretty good uh, pastor marry us. Uh, he's sitting in the front row down there. And yeah, so what I, what I want to leave you guys with is the fact that everything that God creates points to him, okay? The creation points to the creator, not away from him. And I think the biblical model, like, literally points to God. And, and as Christians, we should be cautious on creating entire belief systems that are based on biased interpretations of numbers, readings, and measurements, especially when those interpretations go against the Scriptures and are in direct opposition to our daily lives. So ultimately, we have to make a choice whether we're going to believe theories that are backed by Scripture, logic, and experimentation, or we're going to go with culturally inspired artwork that we see on screens and in textbooks. So I believe that we should prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, and when science and Scripture clash... We should embrace the creator, not the culture. Thank you.
Amen. Hey, man, give him another round of applause. He deserves it. What a beautiful family you have, brother. God's blessed you. That's so awesome, doing your part to replenish the earth with true biblical cosmology believers. <laughs> and, and Jessica, too, will tell her the same, you know. But, uh, yeah, it was great. We went out to Fort Worth, Dallas area, and married Matt and Jessica. Gosh, that was 2019. And, boy, y'all got a crew, man. <laughs> Woo! That is so awesome. That's a blessing. You got many uh, weapons there in your quiver, right? All right, we're going to take, it is now, well, guess what? He got, how did you get through early? Oh, by the way, let me just say this. Matt's got a book out there, and he, it's really, it's illustrated by Paint Tank, and uh, you want to share about that? Yeah, sure. Um, you can, I sell it on Amazon, so you can search Matt Long, The House That Jesus Built, or you just go to mattlongbook.com, and it'll take you straight to the listing there. Yeah. Thanks for coming, yeah, brother. Yes, sir.